All right, let's go grab our Bibles. Let's do something I know a lot more about is preaching. And uh, oh, by the way, man, I had the most wonderful time on Facebook. Uh, there was a graduate of my Bible college. Uh, I don't I wouldn't normally say something like that, but um, I, 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 we have a graduate that's been uh, changing some doctrinal beliefs from what is, uh, you know, simple Christianity. And it got the attention of one of my favorite Bible professors. And, it, and he's not really a Facebook guy. And he, uh, he tore up. He responded to an article that they wrote. And I just, I, I, I had like flashbacks of, of Bible college. And he did not pull any punches. Uh, he just kind of stood. And I'm thankful that the older generation is not being silent, that, that when there's an issue that they lovingly respond. And there was a degree of love. So this professor is just, he, he embodies truth and love. He speaks the truth and love. And yet he was very pointed, but yet loving and gracious. And, oh, I just, oh, it was, it was wonderful. I think we giggled when we were reading the response. It just was, like, perfect. I told Elizabeth, I said, I believe everything he said, but I don't know if I could have worded it that way. Uh, you know, just wonderful that I'm glad for the heritage I received at, at my Bible college. But we do have some first-time guests here in the back, so uh, glad you guys made it. I, um, uh, this young lady, her mom, she said her mom, which is also a young lady, you were walking by. And, uh, and you saw our storefront and stuff like that. You saw it's a new church here. And so, yes, we did start the church five years ago. So we have a welcome bag for you. You might want to give them two. Uh, yeah, give one each to, to each adult there. But uh, you also have our yearly calendar. Now, that's not effective anymore after today. But if you come next Sunday, we have the, this New Year's calendar. So we'll have all the New Year's things. So that just um, probably mentions today's Sunday, and that's it. So it's only valid for one more week. But there's still some good stuff in there. If you would, just fill out that welcome card for a record of our visit, and there's some goodies in there for you as well. But we're thankful you come, uh, came. Let's give them a Liberty View welcome. <laughs> All right, well, let's grab our Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 through 19. So if some of you saw the hustle and bustle, that was our landlords. They, they often come during Sunday school, but... Uh, today they decided, uh, or maybe it was just traffic, they got here right during service time. So it wasn't, you know, it just is what it is. So we'll just keep plugging away. Uh, 1 Peter 4, uh, 12 through 19. I'm going to go ahead and read that, uh, that passage, and then we'll uh, get into the, the verses here. So uh, the Bible says in uh, 1 Peter, make sure in 1, not 2. Sometimes if you make that mistake, you won't be with me. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange... Concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with, also with exceeding joy. And if ye be reproached for my name, for the name of Christ, uh, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as, Christ, suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And it, if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? For if the righteous scarcely be saved, where should the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him, in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So I want to preach a message which I've entitled, Beginning Our Year with God. If you look at uh, verse uh, 17, it really shows us the personal application of this entire truth, really, and even in this entire sermon, that we are to uh, begin judging our own selves. You know, we don't have to wait till someone else kind of judges our behavior or maybe our spouse or something, but we, we kind of self-examine ourselves. You know, am I the Christian I ought to be? Am I following God like I should be? Am I focusing this year on God like I need to be? So we need to begin our year with God, and it really first begins at us. You know, I find that when I'm more self-focused for how I need to change, I'm a little far less concerned about the person across the chairs or the person on the other side of the aisle. You know, if I just kind of focus inward, it's kind of where it starts. It must begin at the house of God. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help us, Lord, to look into these concepts, to focus uh, inwardly and individually and personally to changes that we need to make and help us be uh, uh, help us individually to be better Christians so that collectively we can worship God uh, more strongly as we become a close-knit family. And I pray you'd help us to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I want you to understand this principle. We must begin our year right according to God's word. 
Now, there's a lot of other religions that they'll propose their religion. You, you begin your year right with our religion or our belief system or our set of rules or lists of do's and don'ts. But you know, I'm not trying to give you religion this morning. I'm trying to give you a relationship with God. He is the faithful creator, not, not the creations of multiplicities of religions that propose you know, their lists and their things. And if you don't do their lists, you're not conformed to their image. Uh, we don't conform to their image or religion's image or, or the world. God's image for that matter or Satan's image we we conform to God's image he is the standard he is the uh, uh, he is the goal and the aim of all that we do you know the Bible says we need to transform our thinking our thinking now if you're around a lot of new believers I mean uh, believers that just got saved you know we got a couple around the church right now that are being discipled and those that may be getting some deeper knowledge and it's just refreshing to be around a new believer because their thinking starts to change you know they, they evaluate things they start thinking differently and uh, I remember one of our newer believers, they said, you know, uh, you know it, was, it was the day after New Year's, it was, it was New Year's Day, and he said, you know, you know a couple of years ago, even just one or two years ago, I'd be, I'd be slam drunk right now. Uh, that's all I did on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Is just, I just drank till I was stupid, and that's what I, would, uh, I used to do, but I'm, I'm just glad that I'm different now. So really, it just changes our thinking, you know. Is, is life just all about partying on New Year's Eve? It's just all about just, just getting so drunk you don't remember what happens the next day? Is that what all there is to life? We need to change our thinking in many cases. You know, Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of, our, of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, I think a couple Sundays ago I even said, uh, I believe I'm in, I'm in the perfect will of God. Are you in the perfect will of God? We all should be. Now, that doesn't mean that if I'm in the perfect will of God that I'll automatically be, be transformed into a pastor or I'll just be a missionary or something like that. That if I'm in the will of God, it just always means full-time service and behind a pulpit. No, it means at your job site, you're a full-time Christian. It means, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're, uh, you know, you're playing a sport or you're doing some kind of uh, writing a business email or you're just conversating with, with your associates or other or people in your family, that you're a full-time Christian, that you're in the, the will of God no matter where you're at in life. You know, if you can change the way you think, you can change the way you live. And when the Holy Spirit comes to reside in our life as a Christian, and the first area of your life that goes to work is your mind. You know, when we repent of our sin, repentance essentially is a change of mind. When I came to the cross and got saved, that day that I got saved, I changed my thinking. Before, I thought that sin was all there was to life, but then I recognized that Jesus died for my sin. And I came at the foot of the cross, and I repented of my sin. I changed my mind of how I looked at my sin, and I changed my mind how I looked at the Savior. And I recognized that Jesus was the way to God, was the way of salvation. So in one sense, this year, if you haven't done it already, you need to change your thinking about God. And even when we transformed uh, from our smaller storefront into this larger storefront, we, we, our theme for that whole year was God is big. Or I think then we transitioned to that theme. I can't remember how it all worked, but God, God is big was our theme. At least maybe that was what was rolled out or before. But we had to change our thinking that God is big and even bigger to see us, you know, even as a church, step out by faith. But whether our church steps out by faith, don't just get on the curtails of what God do, is doing around here. Don't just ride our curtails. You see that God is big. You see that God wants to change you, even in your perception of God. We, we, we often put God in a little teeny box. We, we, we just kind of car, 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 carpet, uh, carpet, carpet, what is that word? Carpet, I can't even say it. Uh, we, we put them in a box, <laughs> and uh, it's not right. You know, God, can God be contained to a box? Can God be contained to the universe? And yet we put him in our little box and bring him out when we want him. No, God, is, is, God created the box. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't need to be inside of it. All right, so we change our thinking about God. We change our thinking about self. Satan is the father of lies. I love this whole past year. Our Ladies of Liberty, our, our Ladies Ministry, they focus on lies women believe. And, and Satan wants you to believe his lie. And that he is the way, that this world's the way to be happy and to be fulfilled. And there's much more to yourself than Satan's lies. And there's a lot, a lot we could change there. And we could change our life. The Holy Spirit wants to give you an eternal perspective on life so you can make a better, better and wiser decision. So I even allow the Holy Spirit of God to change my life. And then, of course, others. The Holy Spirit will go to work on your emotions, replacing anger and bitterness with forgiveness and joy. These emotional shifts will completely transform your relationship even with others. So often, you know, God will save us. God will even start to change some of the things, but we don't let him change us in how we deal with other people. We, we act the same way. 
We act the same way in regards to stress. By the way, in 2020, you will have, you will have some stress that you had last year. You're going to enter into the same kinds of stresses and strains and pulls from different things, whether family, work-related, whatever related, but you will have stresses. Are you going to respond differently this year or just the same way you've always responded to stress? And other things, we, we just use stress there. I could put any other thing in that blank. We have focus on money, uh, how I view church attendance and faithfulness to God, service in the church. You're just going to do the same things you did last year, or maybe try to do something else, or maybe do more in the ministry you're already serving in. Just do it in a different way or, or add maybe something small to it. And, of course, that, that it does lead us to church. I need to change my thinking even about church. Now, this is all general Areas of, of how I can change. Now let's look at what God uh, literally says in these verses. Now look at verse 12. Number one, I want you to see the plan. If you take a note, you can write down the plan. Verse 12. Here's the plan. Beloved, and this is kind of a strange plan, granted, but in verse 12, here's our plan. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happen unto you. You know, in, in one way, our thinking should change when it comes to trials. Testing will come. I, would like, I wanted to start this year to let you know what's going to happen. There will be a test. You know, some of our newer believers are starting to make some decisions and get accountability for certain things. And one such person had said, you know, uh, this year I plan to not do this sin anymore. This is my besetting sin. I'm just not going to do it. You know, when we verbalize that, Satan hears, all those little demons, uh, this world hears, other believers hear, uh, everyone around us hears that. And when you declare that, guess where the battle's going to take place? Right then and there for what you just declared. We've got to be very careful. Trials will come. I'm going to serve God through this stress. I'm going to serve God and be more faithful in church. We'll recognize it every Sunday morning. Something's going to happen. The kids are going to go crazy. Uh, you, you, uh, you know, your, your, maybe your oven will break or something. or You have a water leak in the basement. Yes, you'll have a conflict every Sunday morning. If you declare, you know, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to make this big change. Grant it down. You're going to have a fiery trial right there. But your thinking needs to change, though. The plan is that your thinking goes beyond that fiery trial. You know, plenty of people in the Bible, like the list could really go on and on and on, but there's plenty of people that suffered for God in the Bible and, and came out and, uh, and, 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 and served God and stayed faithful and all these kinds of things. Well, you know, it almost goes without saying, but Job. Um, you know, the, the book of Job is vital and is foundational in understanding that, uh, you know, what can happen through a believer through suffering and trials. And it really shows us in chapter 1 that there's an enemy of the Christian, Satan's like, hey, Job just serving you because you're good to him. Uh, Job is just serving you because you're blessing him. Hey, God, let me touch him. Hey, Father, let me touch this guy. He, he just serves you because you're, you're being good. Let me touch him. I'll see what he, why he's serving you. Ultimately, he, he was shut up by that because Job did serve him, uh, you know, with a pure heart. And, uh, but it shows us there's a real enemy. You know, hey, hey, let's take away Glennis' blessings in 20, 2020, Satan says. Hey, God, let, let me touch Glennis' life. Let me give her a disease. Let me, let me destroy her entire family. Uh, we'll see what she's really made of. Trials could come, but don't think it's strange. Job teaches us a very valuable lesson. I don't want that for your life, but if God allows it, we serve God no matter what happens in 2020. Whether everything goes good, whether everything goes bad, God means it for good. God works it together for good, Romans 8, 28. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Now, I know hey, some of you don't want this negativity, but, but I'm, I'm trying to be real with you this morning. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah was uh, promoted by God-given uh, God fire shut in his bones. The Bible, the Bible says that there was a fire shut in his bones. He was, he was weeping over his nation. I mean, he was weeping over their sin, weeping over their just disobedience to God. And he was weeping, weeping. And arguably, zero people were impacted by his message. I can't imagine that, you know, preaching every week, you know, just weeping. And I'm not even weeping right now, but uh, I was almost, uh, I got close to tears in Sunday school. I don't know if anybody got, any of you guys caught that, but I got a little emotional. But, you know, you know every week, Jeremiah's weeping over his sins, and nobody cares. And in essence, that's why he's crying anyway, but nobody cares about his message. Nobody cares that he's uh, fired up about it, but it's a fire in his bones. And uh, he's even thrown down to a well. I mean, there's lots of things that happen to him. He's thrown down in a well. He's uh, he reje rejected, mocked, put in stocks at a different time, uh, all for just preaching God's message. And his story is the story of millions of faithful Christians who just give God's message, yet uh, it's not received well. You think of Joseph. 
uh, Old Testament Joseph, not Mary and Joseph, but uh, as a child, Joseph is thrown down in a well, uh, then he's uh, sold into slavery, then he's falsely accused of rape, then forgotten about in prison, eventually gets out in the palace, uh, and all kinds of things. As we say, Joseph from the pit to prison to the palace, but yet he just serves God, a type of Christ in the Old Testament, uh, argue, arguably, too, and, and from this perspective, of it, it, not a lot that he's recorded that he does wrong here. Uh, he serves God, whether or not any of these pr- perspectives, but he suffered greatly. You know, I don't know if you, you've been in slavery this past week. I know some of your jobs may, may feel like slavery, uh, but he was in real slavery. You know, he was in a real prison, a dark, damp prison, and, and then he was in a real Egyptian palace. But in, in all those, it didn't really matter. See, Joseph wasn't going after a, a, a human perspective. He, he wasn't wasn't living in a human world. He was living in a spiritual world. It didn't matter where he was. He still served God. And of course, John the Baptist, a lot, that, a lot about him too, speaking out against the king and, uh, and his head was cut off for what he did. So a lot of people have suffered yet were faithful to God. You need to change your thinking. Change your thinking. It literally means, uh, uh, um, you know, this idea of, you know, beloved, think not strange concerning the fiery trial. Literally, to feel like people in a strange country lost and bewildered. You know, if you were to go to a country where you don't know any of the language or culture, you'd kind of just feel like you're not in where you are comfortable. You're in a strange country. You're in a place where you don't know the language. You don't know the culture. You don't know why they're doing that or what they're doing or what they're speaking. Or They may even come up to you and speak to you in their language. But you say, I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand what you want me to do. And, and they might even get mad at you. And, and, and just they want you to understand their language and their culture, but you just don't get it. That's what happens to a Christian when we're in a trial, but we don't change our thinking. We don't have our heavenly uh, identification. And so we, we then think it's strange. Why has God allowed this? I don't understand the message he's conveying to me. I don't understand this test. Don't think it's strange when, you, when you're concerning this fiery trial. We need to change our thinking and speak the language of God in these things. You know, um, don't consider it as anything which you had no uh, reason to expect or as anything that may not happen to others also. And we even recognize, you know, sometimes with a trial we think, I'm the only one going through this trial. I'm the only one that has this problem or this stress or this situation. No, there's been thousands of years of history to where there's been believers that have been very similar to your experience right now. Now, yes, there's a definitely a personality difference with you, but there's been very similar things, if not even worse things, that have happened to others. And so number two, it is to test you. It's God's test. Now look at verse 12 again. It's a beloved thing and not strange concerning the fire of trial, which is to try you or test you. It's to test you. And I like to say it this way. You better pass the test the first time or you get a pop quiz you know, the next week or you'll get another test on it. So make sure you try to pass it. Uh, but it is to test you. You know, in 1799, a couple years ago, uh, Conrad Reed discovered a 17-pound rock. And I kind of liked this story when I was reading it because it was about a rock, and I like rocks. Uh, while fishing in a little meadow creek, this was in North Carolina, uh, not knowing what it was made of, his family used it as a doorstep for three years. In 1802, a couple years later, his father, John Reed, took it to a jeweler who identified it as a lump of gold worth about $3,600 of that time. Uh, that lump of gold, which was used as a doorstep for three years in North Carolina, is one of the biggest gold nuggets ever found east of the Rockies. Until its composition was determined and the, uh, its value was unknown. Even so, until the composition of our faith is determined, the strength is unknown. God allows trials in our lives not to hurt us, but to strengthen us and to prove us. The trying of your faith worketh patience, the Bible says. You know, in Job 23.10, even of Job, he said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold, Job says. I'm looking to be a gold Christian. Now, it's not that we, we become gaudy and financially focused when we think about gold, but I want to be a gold Christian. I want to be a, a, a Christian shining that I don't have the dross of the gold process, but I've been tried through that fire, and he's purified me, and I come forth as a, a beautiful lump of gold used for God. Now, you may not be worth $3,600 like that lump of gold, but you, you, whatever your size of gold is may be shiny and used for God's glory so you can reflect his goodness that much more clear. You know, changing the way we think changes our perspective, too. It changes uh, how we act in the world. You know, in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was he trying to convey to, to, uh, to Jewish people as they were uh, recognizing they had been expecting the Messiah? He said, Change your thinking. I'm here. 
Change your thinking. It's no longer to prepare or to plan or to look to the prophets that Messiah is coming, but I am here. Repent now, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is a change of mind. Wouldn't it have been a whole other perspective if every Jewish person believed in Messiah and just the Roman government killed him? Maybe he would have still died on the cross, but, but every, every Jewish person would have become a believer and transitioned from Judaism, from dead works and sacrifices of bulls and goats, and they would, have, they would have transferred that to the kingdom of his dear son, and they would have followed Messiah, and they would have believed in him. That would have been great. Jesus challenged people to change their thinking because regardless how many times you read through the Bible, uh, your mind uh, doesn't change and lets you let it change. You will simply impose your biases and labels on the words you read. Sometimes new believers do that. They'll have a bias from the world or some TV show or some movie about God, and they'll read a verse and they'll try to read it into there. And uh, just recently, too, I was trying to teach someone, and I was telling them, you know, we read the Bible, and we let it change our thinking. So we don't bring in anything to the Bible and try to read in our, our preconceived thought and idea, but we let God just change our thinking. And by the way, I've always said this, and I'll still say it today. I said it when I first got saved. I'll say it right now. If God shows me something that I'm doing that's, that I'm not supposed to be doing, I'll stop doing it. If God tells me to start doing something that I'm not doing, I'll do it. From the day we get saved, that is the principle. If God says do something, start doing it. If you're not doing it currently, start doing it. If God says stop doing this, just stop doing it. God is much wiser than any pastor, than any church, than any religion. Basic fear says, hey, fool, if you jump off that cliff, you won't make it. Get away from the cliff. This type of fear is healthy and good. You know, it keeps you safe. But fear and distrust of life and people isn't from God. Yet it seems hardwired into our minds. We're afraid of being afraid. The Spirit always breathes love, always. So when it comes to biblical faith and trust in God, we don't want to uh, have a fear of man which bringeth a snare. And so it's to be expected. Now, uh, again, in verse 12, there's an interesting, uh, a lot of phrases here. So, you know, thinking of strange creature in the fire of trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Let's, uh, let's kind of flip that a little bit. It's a normal thing. It's a godly thing. It's an expected thing. It's a guaranteed thing, this trial, this test that may happen uh, here in 2020 for you. It's a reality kind of thing, and it's an expected thing, as we've already said. Think not straight. Be not offended or troubled at persecution as, a, as at a thing unusual and never heard of. It implies that it should, uh, should reckon upon it before and that they might not be surprised when it comes. And we ought, we ought to not be surprised when it comes. And then let's transition out of verses 13 and 14. Number two, the partaking. Number one, we saw the plan. Number two, the partaking, the partaking. Look at verse 13. But rejoice inasmuch as you were partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And there's some things in verse 14. But we need to recognize that we're Christ-like when this happens. We, we want to be Christ-like. We want to be partakers of him. We want to be like him. And so when we have a fiery trial and we respond to it correctly, we are the most Christ-like we could be. He was, he was through a fiery trial. He was, through, uh, he was killed on the cross for our sins. And yet he, in all this, he sinned not, never charged God foolishly, never, never, did, never did anything outside the Father's will. And so he partook uh, perfectly in that moment. So the partaking. Um, you know, Job even responded perfectly. He said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, whether God takes away everything in 2020 or gives you everything in 2020. Whether I've got riches uh, innumerable or nothing in my pocket. Lord gives, Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If this church closes, blessed be the name of the Lord. If God blows it out and we have a thousand people within a year, blessed be the name of the Lord. If God gives us all the offerings we could ever want and we have surplus and savings and we can invest in more in missions and do more and get more tracts and do more evangelism, blessed be the name of the Lord. If we can't do nothing but maintain or if we've got to sell things to make it work here or some of us have to get extra hours or jobs, blessed be the name of the Lord. It, you know, it just doesn't matter. If you leave, blessed be the name of the Lord. If you come back, blessed be the name of the Lord. If others come back, if others visit the church, blessed be the name of the Lord. We don't, we're, not, we're not in this to be, uh, get charged off of people and personalities and, and the attendance or the offerings or the, these physical things. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We need to rejoice in our association. See, verse 13 says, but rejoice. The opposite of complain and stress and anger and bitterness and resentment and, and freaky talking or how we, maybe we just get all we just we just get a little fleshly when we talk when we get all hyper concerned on that trial. The opposite is rejoicing. Praise God. 
Praise God. Now, it's a little somewhat, it's somewhat strange even to, to respond this way, but it's biblical. It's godly. You know, praise God. Praise God. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. You're suffering. You're, you're suffering the way Christ suffered. You're, you're doing it the way he would do it in that situation. And you ought to rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in your association. Be it so far from being offended at your sufferings as rather to reckon that there is a great matter of rejoicing in them. Their being trials makes them tolerable, but your being in them partakers of Christ's sufferings makes them comfortable. You know, suffer as Christ did, as members of Christ suffer that are godly. And you are hereby conformed to Christ, the head of the church. It, it is the beautiful association that God has instilled in this perspective that we suffer the way he suffered. And you may be glad and exceeding joy. You know, I love this perspective because it's my association. I, I, I'm, I'm the most Christ-like when I suffer correctly. And then rejoice, secondly, in your magnification. Look at verse 14. Rejoice in your magnification, not just in your glorification uh, uh, or your association with Christ, but in your magnification of Christ. Look at verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Now, this isn't talking about self-inflicted problems or sin-inflicted problems or your sinful response to a problem or stress or issue. We're talking about your suffering correctly. So that's the key here to verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, uh, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. You see, our conversation is honest among the Gentiles, the Bible says in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. You know, and Peter went on to say, uh, whereas they speak uh, against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they uh, shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So when I live correctly in face of all the, the naysayers or the negative comments, my good works convicts their speech. And if nothing else, the day of visitation, when God comes again and, may, and sets it all right, he, he gives out perfect judgment, he, 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 he's keeping a scorebook. He's keeping a record of how I respond to my trial. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, one chapter before the chapter we're in, it says, having a good conscience that whereas they may speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. You know, Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, as people see me, I ought to let my light shine. I ought to let my light shine. Now, let me give you a silly illustration of this. Now, often, uh, Chris has said, when there's a basketball in my hand, it transforms my character a little bit. But although that's very true, uh, I, I do get aggressive when I play basketball. I don't ever get to where I'm sinful when I play basketball. Yeah, there's a whole realm. And you know, if you're not a basketball player or a sports player, you may not get this illustration completely. But, you know, there's some Christians that they become very fleshly and sinful when they do play a sport. They, it, it, it enters a realm to where it's not just being competitive, but you're, you're outright being, you're being, being spirited. You're calling names and getting angry, getting bitter. You know, you, uh, all these kinds of things can wrap, be wrapped up in that. You know, that can be applied to any situation, whether sports, my job, my family. Sometimes, you know, family can get, a, get under our skin so much we, we get into the flesh. You know, I ought to respond in the spirit even with my family. I ought to be Christ-like even how I talk to my family. But sometimes, in, 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 in one way, even much more, sometimes our family can dig so much at us that we lose all our Christ-like behavior and our speech and our attitude and, and our bitterness and all that. You know, we, we, just, we just give in to the flesh with our family. We ought not to do that. You know, um, again, recently I was talking to one of the newer believers in the church, and, and I said, you know, you ought to say please and thank you. And I said, I'm not trying to get on your case, but, you know, uh, we, have, we have no right to order people around. Uh, you know, you could do that if you want, and, and maybe some people will listen, but it's much better done with honey than with vinegar. You know, we ought, we ought, to, we ought to be... be Gracious with our speech. So we ought to rejoice in our magnification of Christ. You know, what do you let shine before other people? Do you let yourself shine before other people? Your hobbies, your self-interests, your stress? Sometimes we, we, we let our stress shine. You know, we're, we're to let our light shine. We let our, our sin shine. We let our mouth shine. We let, let our, our selfishness shine. We let our dirt shine. But we don't often let our light so shine before men. The Bible says, let your light shine. So shine before men, they may see your good works. What often do you talk about during that trial? Don't let your trial shine, let your light shine. Five ways to shine your light in the workplace, apply to a workplace. Words matter. 
It's easy to fall into the speech habits of those around you. But Ephesians and many other passages, you know, uh, James, uh, there's a lot that tells us how, how to speak uplifting to others, even our spouses. Yeah, and by the way, don't just throw trash out to your spouse. Maybe you had a stressful day at work. You know, your spouse isn't your boss. Your, your, your kids aren't your boss. It's time to put that aside and you spend time with family, wrestle around with the kids, love your wife, cuddle with your wife, uh, and vice versa. Of course, I'm, I'm always wife perspective, but wives, you know, cuddle with your husband and, and different things and speak to them and, and find out, what, you know, cook together or something like that. But, you know, sometimes we just we bring in all that work and, and all that we've done during the day and we just unload on our spouse. Now, to a degree, you're going to discuss some things, but it, there's a time to put that aside. Put that away. And even if you aren't married, you know, even with your friends and family, uh, when you come home, it's just time to spend time with friends and family. If you're out with friends, why are you just going to rehash everything and just unload all the trash? Just put that trash, throw the trash out. Number two, an attitude adjustment. Adjustment. Stress and dreaded tasks and uncooperative coworkers, lack of recognition. There are numerous things in your workplace that can bring you down, but how do you react to those things? Do you grumble, complain, or do you choose to trust God? And be positive. And number three, this is the more evangelistic side of shine, letting your light shine. Showcase the truth. And, and that can be done in many ways, by your words, by your actions, even by little things around your office. Does your office look Christian? Do even people, are you kind of an, an, an undercover Christian, kind of an under, under the radar Christian? But showcase the truth. And then, of course, then number four, then go one-on-one. Now, I'm not saying that you beat everybody up with the gospel or about God, but at certain times when it's appropriate, when there's a, a way you could talk about God and church and what God's doing in your life, let your light shine. The Bible says we ought to, and we ought to then go one-on-one when there's opportunity. And number four, show a servant's heart. You know, and by the way, you can tell uh, who's not a servant when you start treating people like a servant. You can find who's a servant real quickly. And uh, those that are servants, when you treat them like a servant, uh, they serve. Now, I'm not talking about slavery, you know, servant, servant, servanthood that turns into a weird perspective of slavery. You know, we're not talking about that, but we're talking about just serving God, serving others. And so show a servant's heart. Don't just be one to go around and just uh, order everybody around. You may even have a degree of authority to do so in your workplace or among even in your family structure. But there's a time to just get down with that person and show them how to get it done. And, uh, and we're not talking about lazy people at work, too. They're just going to be lazy, but, but show a servant's heart. Galatians 1.24, and they glorified God in me, uh, Paul says. Number three, the problem. Number f- three, and quickly, the problem. Look at verse 15. So we're at 1 Peter 4, verse 15, the problem. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. And if any man suffer as, Christ, as a Christian... Third time now, the Christian is using the whole Bible. It's only used three times in the King James. I don't know about other translations, but it's not used a whole bunch in the Bible. Uh, this is the th- third time in our King James Bible, Christians used. If any man suffer as a Christian, uh, the other version, the other, other word the Christian is used and then it's referred to as Christians. It pluralizes it. That's the three uses of it. Uh, but it says, uh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You gotta suffer as a Christian. So the problem is that I suffer wrong, that I my thinking does not change, I stay in the flesh. And so um, there is a degree of a commercial uh, of the culture here. There's a cultural perspective in verse 15. This idea of, as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer and busybody. And uh, and uh, there's this little it's probably not even that important. You know, we're, we're going to skip that. I kind of wrote it down, but it, it's, some, it's some cultural things. If you want that information, I'll share it to you after service. But there's some things that, that maybe Peter was addressing. It's an assumption anyway. That's why I don't even want to talk about it. So let's look at verse 16. Uh, so the caution of the Christian. Verse 16 says, Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You see, uh, the Bible is very clear. You know, in, in Acts 11.26, it puts it this way. When they had found him, uh, he brought them unto Antioch. When it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were, were called Christians first in Antioch. So when I am a proper Christian, I may enter into suffering. So if I'm the Christian I ought to be, when I'm not undercover, when I am letting my light shine, when I am impacting those around me, there will be some suffering that I'll get in return. And, and the caution is that I do it correctly. Now, some people are in the flesh. They'll even be a Christian in the flesh, and then they'll receive suffering, but they've not suffered as a Christian. They've suffered because of the flesh. 
So when I'm speaking to somebody or I'm being vocal in my faith, have I let the flesh show through me? And I'm having a response of the flesh, like, like because I've just been, uh, I've not spoken, you know, a case in point, not speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in, hatred, in hatred or frustration or just correcting someone's behavior. Well, they're not doing, this unsaved person is acting unsaved. They're not acting like a Christian, and I'm going to tell them what the Bible says. You've now just entered in the flesh. You've not, the caution is you've, you're not suffering as a Christian. You, you, stole what the, you told them what is right, but you've not done it as a Christian. You've done it as a fleshly, sinful person. There's a balance to this, too. Am I doing it graciously and kindly? You know, um, my, I've learned. I've learned something in 11 years of being married. That Elizabeth responds far more to my honey, the way I speak when it's, when it's dripping with honey and sweetness, than when it's just uh, harsh with vinegar and hot sauce and and, you know, and fire. And so, you know, I can, I can speak the truth in both ways, but it's received far better when it's just sweet and it's kind and loving. And sometimes how we deal with people, it's, uh, it's just not as a Christian. And it's, it qualifies it as a Christian. Peter proposes, uh, purposely uses the name, which is a name of derision among the heathens. It is not as yet one by which believers would usually describe themselves. So a perspective of that word usage here by Peter. So it wasn't just thrown around like we do today. And uh, a concern that is coming. Look at verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and it must first begin at us. So a message like this, we can automatically think, oh, man, that guy, he's a hypocrite. Oh, that person, man, they, they spoke the truth to me, but it was just in the flesh. Man, I could just tell. They were angry. And we, 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 we throw out the truth. Hey, by the way, if you're suffering as a Christian correctly and if you can receive counsel as a Christian correctly, it doesn't matter how it's given to you. It doesn't matter if a Christian cusses at you. It doesn't matter if they're just getting angry with you. It doesn't matter if they spit in your face, point in your face, and say, this is the way you're acting. There's a degree of truth in it. And by the way, what I like so much about that professor that responded correctly is he, he agreed with some of the arguments and he said, that is true. So even though the source could be some crazy source, there's a degree of truth in it. Logically speaking, uh, there's ways I can improve. There's ways I can do better. Yes, you spoke the truth. And yeah, I don't like the way you talked to me, or I don't like the way you said it, but that doesn't matter. That's, that's just an emotion. And yet that person needs to change, but I, it, that, doesn't, that doesn't have any bearing on my life. I can understand that. So a concern that is coming, it must begin at me. At me. How can I change? Not how can you change or that person change or this person. Uh, that guy in the back of the church, he needs to change. Or that girl over there, man, and that believer, she needs that a good dose of pastor's message. No, how can, how can I change? A faithful creator. Now, I love this quote, and I, I just got to read it in its entirety. Uh, it's, just, it's just a little short paragraph. Suppose in the place of God as creator, we substitute chance or fate or law. What a blank we have at once in the highest regions of thought and feeling. If you are only the offspring of blind, unintelligent, unknown force, if you are the product of something that men call a tendency or a law, are you not immediately let down from a conscience dignity, which has been one of the most ennobling factors of influences in your life? As a child of God, you have a supreme motive to be godlike. As a creature of force, you are deprived of all such motives if you give it to chance. And I, I just love that. You know, he's a faithful creator. Look at again at verse um, at uh, verse eight, uh, 19. Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him, in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. It's time to live right. It's time to stop committing your besetting sin. It's time to stop being a hypocrite. It's time to be genuine. It's time to be Christ-like. He's a faithful creator. The faithful creator allows suffering. The faithful creator wants you to be in the perfect will of God. The faithful creator wants you to guard your life. The faithful creator wants your emotions and soul to be in check with God's word and his will. The faithful creator wants you to do well, and the faithful creator is a faithful creator. He created you to suffer well. And in 2020, it's coming. Mark it down. Expect it. It's going to happen. Stress will enter. Perspectives will come in your life that you don't understand completely, but expect it and suffer correctly. Go, go get a dose of Job, get a dose of Joseph, uh, read some Paul stuff. You know, read the Bible. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of these people just, they suffered well. I want you to suffer well this year. It's coming. I want you to respond to it correctly. And that really closes the purpose of what God intended for all this. The plan all the way to the purpose 
God wants us to do some things uh, correctly. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight valiantly onward, evil passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, uh, and we'll just stop right there. We'll cut off the sentence because it has to begin at us. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help us, Lord, with these principles of starting our year right, just kind of maybe gearing us up for how you're going to maybe even move this next Sunday. But, Lord, I, I pray that we would uh, suffer correctly this year. It's going to happen, stress and lack of sleep and pressures and requirements and responsibilities, uh, family obligations, all these things play a part in my life and even my spiritual growth. Some of these things uh, uh, squeeze out and push out Bible reading and meditation and prayer, and it should not. Lord, I, I don't have time not to read the Bible. I don't have time not to pray. I don't, I don't have time to not focus on you, the Spirit of God working in my life. Lord, I need you to change me. I need you to mold me into, into a better pastor this year. I need to be a, a, a just surrendered completely to thy will in every moment and every way I pastor your dear people. But as our heads bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe God spoke to you about something. And really, you really, really, to just be honest, I'm preaching to myself this morning, so if nobody gets anything out of it, I need this message. I need to change. It begins at me. If, if you don't have a biblical pastor, you're not in a biblical church. You ought to have a biblical pastor that's surrendered to God. If I'm not surrendered, how can I, how, how can I preach about you being surrendered to God if I'm not surrendered? This message is for me, for Pastor Dave. But if, maybe, maybe you got some gleanings from it. Maybe God spoke to you about it. And you, you would say, Pastor Dave, would you just pray for me? God's got to do some work in my life about some of these issues. And, 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 and I just need God to, to help me rearrange my thinking when it comes to suffering, even in this year. Anybody like that? Just, Pastor, would you pray for me? God has addressed some issues in my life I need to, I need you to pray, help me to pray for. I see the hand. Anybody else? I, uh, Pastor, would you pray for me? There's some areas in my life I need to change and correct. All right, Heavenly, I see that hand. Thank you very much. Heavenly Father, I pray you just help us, Lord, to refocus this year. And when it comes, Lord, and we, maybe we expect it, but Lord, let us respond correctly to it. And, and not that we're suffering because we've, we've snipped off someone's head or we spoke in, in an unkind manner, but we, we just have done right and, and still got that response. And we've still got uh, um, the flesh back at us. But Lord, help us respond correctly in that moment. Help us to, to get our emotions in check and our perspectives uh, to be more in alignment with God and his word. And Lord, I pray you help us to, for it to begin at us. We begin in this house of God, this location where your people are gathered together and congregating in this location, Lord. I just want our church to just be surrendered to God. I want our church to be just uh, bubbling out of love and service to our Savior, to our Messiah. And Lord, I pray you just help us to have this perspective. And then when it comes, Lord, we're, we're prepared. We're ready to pass that test. We're ready to, to get all the answers right. And Lord, we may not even have all the answers, but at least we know that we're expecting this test to come. And Lord, I pray you'd help us with these areas, and especially when it comes to even our homes and our children and our workplace and those that are under us in authority. I just pray you'd help us to be Christians in all perspectives of our life. We thank you for it, Lord. Would you help us with these things? In Jesus' name, amen.